adaptation is on the street, and particularly adaptation. So adaptation is a sort of infinite um, <coughs> that we don't actually know when it's going to stop. We know that it's already started. We don't know if we're going to have a one and a half degree temperature world, or a two degree, or a three degree, and maybe God forbid a four degree world. But whatever those degrees are, whether it's the one and a half degree or it's the four degree, it still requires a huge amount of adaptation, response, and ambition. And financing that is difficult because with mitigation you can quantify and you can put a box on it, right? You can say it's going to cost us X to reduce emissions by Y. We can't, we can't apply that formula in, in adaptation finance. And so we have a massive challenge with this. We know that finance is a critical enabler of climate resilience. If you can't pay for it, you often can't have it. And um, microfinance is particularly necessary at a, at a subnational level. So what the key sort of challenge or question that we've been looking at in this research week and the different countries involved that have been dealing with is how to get money from a large pot that say the PPCR has or an MTP has or the Green Climate Fund has or whoever has at their disposal. How do you get that money from that big pot to the hands of the people who <coughs> use that money? Um, that's, that's really a, a, a simple question, and this is something that challenges everybody all the time. Um, and just bearing in mind that the Green Climate Fund, one of the key indicators for adaptation finance, is the number of vulnerable communities in the reach. Um, and the GCF developed that, among many other indicators that they have, through a collaborative process with different countries that are represented on the GCF. So this is an indication that we all wanted, right? Um, and now our challenge is how, how do we get to, to that point? Um, so there are many barriers. And as I said already, it's hard to get the money from source to vulnerable communities. It's one of the biggest barriers. Um, but with that, so it's a two-way street. So how do you get the financial institutions to take the risk of lending money to poor households that are not used to receiving a line of credit in some form or the other. It's a massive risk for financial institutions. And our finding, one of our key findings in this work is that if you don't deal with both ends of that spectrum and you only deal with one, it's not going to work. Um, so it, you need to deal with the financial institutions as much as with the vulnerable communities. And then last but not least is how to sensitize both ends of that spectrum in terms of what to do with that money. So financial institutions are very good at lending money and, and navigating and managing and limiting their risk, right? This is what they do. They're all about risk. If you ever want to get some insight on how to manage risk, I would suggest the best thing is to go and talk to a seasoned financial institution. This is what they do. What they don't do is climate change adaptation. So what they don't understand is what the opportunities are around climate change adaptation. And therefore, they don't understand why you can actually manage your risk by lending money to people that need it to improve their yields from agriculture or to start a small business that's around adaptation. They don't, they will never understand how to, that they can actually manage that risk because people might actually earn greater income and be able to pay back the money. So they need to be taught that. Um, and so just assuming that a financial institution can do this because they're a financial institution is already uh, a bit of a misnomer. If you can make this attractive to the microfinance institutions or the cooperative banks or even maybe later on as we build up scale around this, the commercial banks, actually what we're offering them is, is access to new markets. Right? Um, a market that they've never tapped. Um, and as I also said, the access to new markets, and I think we should never ignore this, has been a very important um, incentive for, for the, the banks and finance institutions that have become involved to get involved. So they are risk averse and they are worried about managing the risk, but if we can help them manage that, they will do it because there's an opportunity for, for new markets. The question was if you're targeting households and community level through small loans, how do you actually really achieve scale uh, with adaptation? 
And I think the answer in part lies in what Jamaica has done. And you heard it from Tajikistan, you heard it from Rwanda, you heard it from Italy. It's framing the macrofinance solution in the bigger picture climate change challenges that go on in that country. <coughs> from everybody. So in Jamaica, the key um, economic sectors that are affected by climate change are agriculture and tourism. Um, and therefore, they focus their microfinance solution around agriculture for enterprises and operations in the agriculture and the tourism sectors. Um, and as I said earlier, the idea there was to target households, but actually more to target small enterprises. And, um, and, that's, and they hope. Um, and remember, this is a pilot program for climate resilience with the emphasis here on pilots. And Raul, you mentioned this. The idea with the PPCR is to test things and then to scale them up. Um, the idea is to get enough of a, an answer as to the scale question, but not actually to achieve scale in the PPCR. Is that correct, Sorry. Yeah. So the PPCR is supposed to demonstrate what's possible and what can be done with enough evidence to show that scale is plausible, um, but not actually to achieve a scale, because even though it was a lot of money, and that Laurie and Raoul talked about in the bigger picture, it's not that much money um, that's available. So the point with Jamaica was to target their most vulnerable economic sectors, agriculture and tourism, and to extend loans, many loans, so that they do more and more uptake. And the idea is to leverage, and that's a key word in terms of, it's a making word, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a key word in terms of looking at this. <coughs> so I think there are two things that have come from Jamaica in that regard. One is a programmatic type approach, so lending money in two sectors that are highly vulnerable and, and getting solutions off the ground that together add up to an overall program of, of adaptation in two sectors in, in Jamaica and the other is to enable leverage. Um, so both through you know community seeing what other community members are doing, as other enterprises are doing to adopt certain approaches. Um, but also for different banks to start getting involved and to scale up the loans. But always remembering that you're coming back to these two, two key sectors. So it's not adaptation finance for anything, it's adaptation finance for tourism and agriculture. These are the four, the circling of the world, the four enabling, key enabling conditions. I mean, obviously there are lots of suspects and nuances to this. It's never as simple as it looks, and I'm not trying to make it look simpler than it is. Um, this requires a lot of work and effort to make it happen, and preparation, as I said. And the preparation comes into the awareness raising. And we, I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that if we make a poster or a radio commercial or whatever, that we've raised awareness. Actually, what Jamaica's doing in constantly meeting with the mutual bank and reviewing where they are with the loans like on a monthly basis, that's awareness raising. And, you know, that's, that's a constant sort of working with both the communities and the lender of money um, to just rethink, relook at, learn by doing um, all of the key aspects that arise, some of which you may expect and some of which are great to find. But it's about managing that. Uh, you cannot support climate resilience without bringing the communities and the private sector on board. Uh, so during the design of the project or the fund itself, uh, we had this in mind, we're like, how do we bring the private sector on board to financial institutions and how do we actually reach out to communities? So we have the banks in place. However, this is an area they're not interested in. Uh, first of all, it's very risky and it's an area they don't understand. So capacity building, marketing, as you rightly asked initially, was something worth considering. So when we designed the fund, we actually had instruments to support communities and other private sectors. But we had to work with microfinance institutions to administer because we didn't have reach to the community. <coughs> uh, we're best in a capital city and you know you need institutions closer to the population. So we designed a credit line, uh, which was supposed to be administered by commercial banks. Uh, we launched an expression of interest so that we can see who's interested and we only got one bank in the entire country, which is in the capital city, so actually not reaching the community. And in terms of the instrument we designed, we're actually looking at a threshold that was borrowing <coughs> at least a minimum of $50,000. Uh, 
So 80% of our population is in agriculture, and they need loans of between a thousand and ten thousand dollars. So that's 80% of the market segment left out. So what are we doing with the PPCR in particular in terms of addressing some of those issues? Uh, we've basically designed three instruments. Uh, the first one is the climate smart learning platform. So this is basically for communities to practice climate smart agriculture. And how does this work? So you basically have an MFI administering these concessional loans to communities. And the criteria is that a farmer or a community is actually practicing climate smart agriculture. So these are highly concessional and it works as a revolving fund. Uh, you give grants to the microfinance institutions for them to be interested in the sector in the first place. And they administer loans to the communities at an interest rate of 2%. Uh, the gray market rate right now is 18% in Rwanda. So 2% actually incentivizes the farmer to you know, uh, use this tool. Uh, there are a number of challenges, as always, there are. First of all, it's awareness. On the demand side, we see that people are, have little knowledge about the risks of the climate change and how they can deal with those risks. So it's a, it's a low awareness on the demand side, the general public awareness. Secondly, supply side, the supply market is still under developed, under developed in Tajikistan. For instance, if you look at the photovoltaic PV solar uh, uh, solar technology providers, there are two major companies who work in Tajikistan, and they are not covering in Tajikistan. They are focused on the city. So this market still needs support. That's why we are also supporting suppliers. We are engaging suppliers, helping expand their businesses as well. One of the other challenges they've had is around the existing capacity of NGOs. So they've been using NGOs as did Tajikistan um, to create awareness, to market, and I'll come back to the marketing question later. Um, but the capacity of those NGOs, the same as the banks, didn't necessarily understand the opportunities in the adaptation sector and also have to be educated. So you know, there's a lot of taking people along with you in, in this kind of process. Managing risk is a critical component. So as I said earlier, the financial institutions are a master at this. Um, but we have to teach them how to manage adaptation risks and, and what the benefits are of doing so. So that's really important. It also raises awareness. And this is also an issue around managing the uncertainty. So I said earlier that uncertainty associated with climate change is, is often a barrier. Um, private sector disbursement. Um, creating a, cult a culture of compliance in a market that's perhaps not used to. There are very few financial institutions that actually understand climate change risk. And so they don't go down the road of risk they don't understand. So part of our job in the adaptation community is to educate them. Um, and this is particularly true in vulnerable and developing countries where the financing institutions are there much fewer of them. Um, they have very different kind of reach. Their risk profile is heightened by the fact that they not really in the mood to lend money to people that they fear will never pay back. Um, in those in those companies that are typically very poor. So conditional finance is important because what it basically means is you can take a pot of money and and disperse it slowly. So that pot of money can be earning interest and sitting safely in a in a bank. Um, and the slow disbursements that are um, perhaps done incrementally and over time and in small chunks so that you're de-risking, um, that's part of what constitutional finance can do. It's the kind of risk a traditional financing institution will not take, um, but it now can take <coughs> because they've been enabled to do so by the <coughs> constitutional finance. MDBs uh, can mitigate the risks of the banks and MFIs uh, when lending uh, to these climate vulnerable borrowers. MTBs can open new markets for banks and uh, MFI by raising awareness, building new and different capacities, establishing financing mechanisms that are risk manageable to lenders and borrowers alike.
So these projects are assessed individually and we require some um, our engineering team to go through verification processes. We have preliminary pre-approved list of eligible technologies. These technologies being checked by our engineering team and being uh, accepted as uh, technologies generating sufficient energy or water savings. So we provide financing for specific technologies listed in this list of eligible equipment. about the capacity building on this, how to build. You cannot just think in um, just let's do adaptation, let's do whatever and then we bring, but without anticipating putting the, a clear instrument, a proper capacity building um, program for those institutions to be able to. Private sector disbursement, creating a, col a culture of compliance in a market that's perhaps not used to, you know, this notion of like, actually we're making three payments every month. Um, and I have to do something in the <coughs> and I have to go talk to the banker and make them work with me. You know, that's it's part of the awareness raising, but it's also part of understanding um, how to create that kind of culture of, of compliance, which the private sector understands typically. Um, but households that are not used to borrowing money are not familiar with this. Um, and it's really important, as we've learned from a couple of countries, to avoid loans being seen as a government grant. We've spent quite a lot of efforts working with the partner financial institutions in building their capacity. So we have had a lot of different workshops, trainings with the partner institutions to build their capacity and to help them to understand how the climate green finance could be integrated into their, as usual, business daily operations. So this is another area which still needs a continued ongoing job work. Local financial institutions have the potential willingness to act as agents of change to rapidly and sustainably increase the market's penetration of climate resilience technologies. Government extended money is often then perceived as a grant and not as a loan and not something that needs to be paid back. So that's been a, a key learning. And then lastly is this issue of deep reach into community. We will not be able to reach the kind of adaptation at scale that we want if we can't penetrate the communities that need the money the most. Many communities do not have access to that money because they are not banks. So they they, they, they trying to have the bank, there's no bank. And on the other hand, the, the, the banks also have some specific requirements for them to open a bank account. One of the projects that they um, thought of is to get the districts to have the banks. That was the first thing. So they created this um, one district, one bank uh, program, which would allow all the districts to have bank. Um, before, uh, like as of now, we have uh, around 150 districts, and uh, um, half of them do not have a bank. My last, last comment is, is like a tweet for the day, um, and it's around scale and programming and leveraging and solving the technology problems. Is and what the PPCR has done is to think big, start small, and scale really fast. <laughs>